The age-old argument of PC versus console is certainly a very personal preference, but for me, the PC always comes out on top. There are absolutely massive quantities of games on the PC, but you can play those games at higher visual settings as well as frame rates that is possible on the console. There are tons of mods available, so you can adjust not only how the game plays, but improve the visuals even more than what the developers uh, intended, which is really cool actually for older titles. Uh, Half-Life 2 RTX, for example, looks absolutely phenomenal, and I'm really looking forward to its release. But the PC is also flexible in many other ways, and of course you can well, learn something like Unreal Engine 5 if you want to create your own title, or maybe mess around with Blender, or maybe you could file a tax return. I don't know. With that said, the PC also has lots of flexibility in terms of its hardware configurations. Now, obviously, you can plonk down a lot of cash and buy a high-end desktop. You could also go with a laptop, but also one of these is pretty cool as well, which is a mini PC. Now... I will say that I don't necessarily think a mini PC is for everyone, but I do think for certain um, setups and for certain homes, a mini PC can be a really cool addition. And I have to say that I've been testing this one out for a couple of weeks right now. This one is from B-Link, and they did send me this over for review. By the way, this is not sponsored. This is an EQ13. It's powered by an older Lake uh, N200 processor. We'll get into the technical details in just a moment. And as I said, I've been messing around with this for a couple of weeks at this point, and I have to say that it's really cool. Now, naturally, it can run some games locally, uh, and kind of older indie platform titles, those will work absolutely phenomenally. You can also run emulators, which we'll look at in a moment. For example, PlayStation 1 titles, Sega Genesis, SNES. Those kind of games are easily, you know, playable locally. But perhaps the key thing other than, again, being able to file your tax return on this, is you can also stream titles via Steam, and that is pretty cool if you want a small system in your living room rather than having a big, chunky uh, desktop. That said, let's get into the review, shall we? So, as usual, we'll begin with an overview of the aesthetics and specifications of this device, and then we'll look at some benchmarks and look at usage in gaming. So, as for the mini PC's looks, aesthetically it's pretty low-key, which I think is perfect for a device such as this. The whole purpose of this unit is to not draw attention to itself, and the plastic in my particular model is tinted navy blue, with a honeycomb-like pattern across the top, all pretty plain apart from the logo in the bottom corner. As for the rest of the unit, it feels solid, but of course pretty tiny. It's about 40mm in height and 126 by 126 mm in length and width, so it easily fits in your palm, well at least my one. As previously referenced, the B-Link EQ13 is powered by an Intel Alder Lake N200 CPU, so this the CPU will sport 4 cores and 4 threads. It's configured for a 25 watt TDP, and as this obviously means the device is essentially all but silent thanks to a small but quiet built-in fan. While it's not part of the specs, I also want to point out that there's no separate power brick here. The PSU is built right into the device itself, which makes cable management much easier. Now, if that's important to you, of course it's going to be very much dependent on your setup, but personally I think it's pretty nice. Regardless, the unit is outfitted with 16GB of DDR4-3200, which isn't a huge quantity of RAM in this day and age, but, well, I think for a device like this, it's probably enough for most users. Again, this is not a PC which is designed around image editing being the primary goal, for example, a Photoshop document with 200 layers, or hefty 3D rendering, or that type of thing. The device sports a 512GB SSD out of the box, although it's dual m2 drives allow you to throw in up to four terabytes of storage do note though that the empty slot again there's only two in this unit is only an nvme one slot which is obviously going to hurt bandwidth and io significantly this is not really a fault of b-link but instead just a limitation of the n200 based older lake cpu basically speaking there's only nine pcie lanes here we'll get into the performance of the ssd more in just a moment though for io and connectivity of the mini pc there's wi-fi 6 included and on the rear there's a dual lan support up to 1000 mbps three usb type a's two being usb 3.2 and the other being usb 2 
two HDMI ports, so if you do choose, you could run dual screens if you want. For example, with some type of uh, office work, that could be kind of handy, and an AC cable. On the front, meanwhile, there's yet another USB 3.2, a 3.5mm audio jack, pretty standard, a USB-C port, and a single power button, and a clear CMOS button too. Although you may need to poke that with something like a sewing needle. After all, you don't want to do that accidentally. And of course, an obligatory power light. It is a bit of a shame that there's only a single USB-C port on the machine, but of course you could run a USB hub if you so need to. But um, I also don't know where else I could lump this in, but I'll just mention it here. You can, of course, access the EQ13's BIOS, and there's no shortage of options that you can play around with. The usual boot options, various tweaks you can make to the integrated peripherals, adjusting the boost behavior of the CPU, the iGPU, and so much more. For the purposes of this video, though, I ran everything at default behavior as it came to me from the factory. I could probably play around with things, maybe get a little bit of additional performance out of the CPU by again adjusting its boost behavior, but I don't think the majority of people are going to want to do that, and so I decided that factory default is probably the best way to test things. So again, let's get on to the benchmark, shall we? I will briefly point out that once again, the spare slot in the NVMe drive is only 1x, which of course would provide a lack of I.O. versus what you would get in a 4x slot. But I think for most usage that you would use this machine for anyway, such as running a media server, such as Plex files, it's probably going to be okay in most cases. You're not exactly going to be hammering the maximum achievable I.O. of one of these drives unless you're streaming across multiple users high bitrate files but you could also run of course uh, drives using usb c which might also be handy if you do need additional storage space but um, anyway for the benchmarks i decided to test hardware performance for light office use a bit of heavier cpu uh, performance and a bunch of other tests like, ga like gaming and streaming First of all, PC Mark 10 gives me an overall score of just over 3,000 points, and the various breakdowns of web browsing, content creation, and so on provide a great insight into the strengths of the machine. Basically speaking, if you want to run something like OpenOffice for word processing, spreadsheets, or lighter image editing such as GIMP, then you'll be good to go, but obviously if you wanted to do something highly computationally expensive with this machine, then that might be a little tricky. I also benchmarked using CPU-Z and scored 400 points in single thread, 1425 in multi-thread, and this is using version 17.01 of the test. To put this into some level of context, that's going to be roughly on par with a 2500K or a Ryzen 2000 series CPU in single thread. Once again, I want to stress, of course, this is a low-power processor, but it's decently impressive for what it is. I also ran Geekbench, and my single core score nudged just past the 1200 finish line, A multi-thread missed narrowly my I had 3200. I also ran Cinebench R23, just for the hell of it, though of course this system isn't exactly a rendering powerhouse. I scored 2918 for multi and 978 for single. Now, it's worth noting that Geekbench and Cinebench did narrowly miss uh, B-Link's own scores for the EQ13. However, in their defense, at this point I'd already installed Steam, plus several other applications were running, and of course, God knows what's happened in terms of Windows updates since they did their tests and I've done mine. I also ran both AS, SSD, and Crystal Disk, essentially pointing to a 500GB SSD hitting just under the 500 megabyte per second mark for both read and write with the former, as in AS SSD, and Crystal Disk sailed past the results, particularly under read, hitting around 560 megabytes per second. Again, this is perfectly acceptable for a device like this, and playing back something like a 4K video stream that's local on the disk should be pretty much fine even for a couple of users. So what about gaming and streaming from, let's say, another machine using Steam? Of course, the Alder Lake N200 does have a built-in iGPU, but of course it's not going to be capable of running the latest 3D games at the highest settings. But it does provide us more than enough power to emulate older consoles and also run some lighter games on Steam as well. 
Because of all of this, I decided to test the B-Link in a few different ways. The first would be lighter games on Steam, the second would be emulated titles, and finally, I would use um, the ability to stream games via Steam from my main rig and then basically stream them into the living room using the B-Link. So starting out with a native game on Steam, I had to try Half-Life 2. It's one of my favorite games ever, and it is pretty old now, but it plays absolutely fantastically with the system. At 1440p, with all the settings essentially maxed out, I would regularly hit 90 to a low 100 frames per second in the first portion of the game. I have nothing really much more to say. It's Half-Life 2. It plays well. Hollow Knight and Blasphemous 2 were next, and ultimately these games are ironically actually more taxing than Half-Life 2, despite them being 2D pixel art. Frame rates would generally hold around 60 FPS mark when running the titles at 1080p, and though of course this would vary somewhat based on the area of the game. It's very playable though, and I'll quickly point out that while my gameplay did kind of suck a few times here, um, it's not actually because of the latency of the game, it's quite simply because I was using a capture window for this stuff, and it basically adds maybe around a third of a second, possibly more of latency. So it's not the fault of the machine itself, it's basically the fact that I haven't played these games in absolutely ages, and well, I was also dealing with additional latency, so that wasn't like deal. Um, I also threw in some gameplay of Bioshock Remaster. Now, this is one of those games that uh, is pretty much borderline playable. It's pretty much what you would expect from, say, an Xbox 360 back in the day. In terms of how it plays, there are some dips here or there, but at 1080p, um, it runs fairly well. Unfortunately, there's not a huge amount of options in this game to tinker with to improve performance, but I think that I could probably play this game quite well and enjoy it, to be honest, if this was how I got to play it. But let's take things to the living room, shall we? Um, I decided on one night to do a bit of evening gaming in a living room and unfortunately I couldn't use my capture rig here because it would require me just bringing in a crap ton of wires and stuff so unfortunately I have to use a uh, camera but ultimately Streets of Rage 4 was the final game I decided to run on Steam natively and I don't really have much to say about this one. It is more than playable and with some scaling applied around 60 to 70%. Uh, obviously it's going to depend on your uh, screen resolution but still the game ran absolutely great for me i also decided to do some testing with the playstation 1 emulator known as duck station i decided to run castlevania symphony of the night i still own the original ps1 discs and it was one of the first games i bought on the ps1 back in the day the default settings of the emulator proved to be no problem at all, so I enabled a bunch of filtering, increased scaling to 5x. Long story short, the game ran absolutely beautifully on the hardware. Similarly, I decided to try out Genesis and Mega CD games too on emulator. Now, because obviously those consoles are significantly less taxing to emulate, you shouldn't really be too surprised that, well, everything ran pretty well. I'm also really reminded that I need to play through a bunch of old Sega CD games from my childhood. Uh, Fundhawk, for example, is a really good example of what the Sega CD is capable of, uh, with some pretty impressive, for the time anyway, scaling and rotational abilities. Now, the night was getting late, and so the spooky hour was here, and I decided to finally stream a game from my main PC. This is located in my office, and of course it's going to use the Wi-Fi network around my home. I won't go into the details of how to stream a game via Steam in this video. I'm sure many of you guys know how this works anyway, but long story short, the system, unsurprisingly, ran great. Now, I will admit that I did have some Wi-Fi connectivity issues with a weak signal with my particular device, but I don't want to throw the B-Link under the bus. I think there might be some issue with the router and a dead zone, because I've noticed this can actually occur with my TV occasionally disconnecting as well, and even my cell phone in that room, for some reason or another, just has really crappy um, just performance when it comes to like doing bandwidth tests or whatever. So I think I'm probably gonna have to get like a Wi-Fi repeater or something like that. So I think it's a me problem is basically what I'm saying. However, I did wanna mention it just because. Um, either way, Silent Hill 2 is actually a great game to play with this kind of setup on the couch. I plugged in an Xbox controller via USB 
and everything just ran great. I also tried God of War Ragnarok pretty briefly, um, but obviously this game's got a pretty lengthy opening, and there's not really much to say anyway. Everything just ran perfectly. Streaming via Steam Link is made so the device which is actually running the game does most of the heavy lifting, so as you would expect, it's just going to run pretty well. So then, is the B-Link EQ13 worth the price of admission? Well, there are certainly no shortages of devices like this on the market, but ultimately this one costs just over £200. It's currently available, at least at the time I'm recording this, for £215 Great British Pounds. And for the money, I don't think it's too bad at all. Like I said in the uh, performance part of this review, ultimately this can run many titles um, like indie games absolutely flawlessly or perhaps with maybe a little bit of concession in terms of the resolution. But obviously high performance games, not so much. But naturally, again, this is where it makes a really good case for itself um, being able to stream games from your living room. Obviously, things like Pikes are also going to run pretty well on this thing. So, is it a one-size-fits-all? No. But if you need a cheaper device, for example, for browsing the web, for office tasks, or maybe for light gaming, then this is pretty cool. But for me, this is probably going to be uh, sitting in my living room, honestly, streaming games, because uh, I think that's going to be absolutely excellent. And I have to say, that's how I've been playing Silent Hill recently. Uh, Silent Hill 2 Remake, by the way, is absolutely fantastic. And if you've not checked it out yet, I would suggest you do so. With that said, guys, take care of yourselves. Have an amazing day. Bye for now.